Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. For the release of the fifth edition of the Cross Channel Institute Barometer relating to the Franco British relationships for 2021. A quick word on Cross Channel Institute. It is a non political think tank whose target and ambition is to facilitate the cross channel relationship between France and the UK, just as a reminder. For this event, I am very pleased to welcome Timothy Vignard, Director at Pricewaterhouse, PwC, Raphael Pofik, Manager, and Guy Bevan, Senior Consultant. They are going to do the presentation of our cross-channel economical and financial flow evolution between 2020 and 2021. And we have also the, the chance to get back Barry Andrew, delegate MP at the Euro UK Parliamentary Corporation Assembly, based in Brussels, Xavier Jaravel, associate professor at the London School of Economics, and Paul Taylor, who is here, director of the DIT at the British Embassy. They are going to share with you the their insight on what could be the future for both, economy in, in both economies in the current geopolitical environment, which includes inflation, lack of energy, war at the European border, and still risk of pandemia, without mentioning difficulties with China. So how will it restart 2022 2021, 2020, 2022, and 2023 economies are still going to recover, or are we moving to an economic crisis, economical crisis or recession? The conclusion of the of this seven will be done by uh, the chairman of the Franco-British Chamber, Thierry Drillon. Now, Guy. Timothée, up to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Francoise. <clears throat> Good morning and uh, welcome, everybody. Um, thank you to the Cross Channel Institute team for receiving us today. So before, before I, I go on in, uh, in presenting the parameter, uh, I would like also to, to thank the team involved. Uh, and our partners uh, from the Franco-British Chamber and the Department of uh, International Trade for their collaboration in, in producing the, the study. This is the fifth edition of the, of the barometer, um, and 2021 is a year to remember for a number of reasons. First of all, this is the first year uh, post-COVID pandemic, which has triggered lockdowns uh, in both the UK and France, and serious damage uh, to the global trade. It is also the first year after the end of the Brexit transition period. And finally, it is uh, the year during which global trade was affected by uh, several major disruptions um, in the supply chain. Uh, and one significant e example of that uh, was the blockage of the Suez Canal by the ever given chip in uh, March this year. So how, how could, we, could we call 2021? Can we call it a maintenance year where everyone uh, wakes up uh, post-COVID and assesses its loss? Can we call it a transition year between COVID and Brexit and the future where everyone is trying to understand how global trade is going to work? Well, you'll see with the example of, of the UK and France uh, relationship that it's a mix of both. In a nutshell, what does the, the study tell us? Uh, it tells us that in 2021, British, uh, Franco-British um, trade totaled 76 billion euro um, of trade. Uh, with around 50 billion of trade made up of goods and the remaining uh, 
Uh, so 26 billion of euro uh, of exchange uh, in services. So this is an overall increase of trade uh, of just over 2% compared to 20, 2020, um, which is worth 1.6 billion euro. Um, but obviously it is a, a decrease of 26% compared to 2019. So um, this, is, this is still uh, a, a recovery. Now, with the data available since our first barometer in 2017, uh, we can evaluate the evolution over the last five years. So what, does the, the, what do the, the figures tell us? It tells us that between 20, 20, 2017, sorry, uh, which was the first year after the British referendum, and 2021, which is the first year since the exit uh, from the European Customs Union and the application of the EU-UK uh, Trade and Cooperation Agreement, we can compare uh, uh, both years. Uh, of, unfortunately, uh, this is made a bit less easy by the impact of, of COVID-19. But what we can see is that after a long period of growth uh, in, in trade volumes between uh, 17 and 19, uh, 2020 marked a, a, a halt from which uh, the two countries are just initiating their recovery. To further illustrate what we're saying about stabilization, maintenance, transition, we can compare the, the quarterly percentage of change in France and UK's GDP, which has evolved, as you can see, relatively similarly. And it's plain to see the stabilization in 2021 uh, that follows the drop in, uh, in 2020. You can see that on the, on the graph at the bottom of, of this presentation. So I'm now going to hand over to Guy, who's going to comment on, on some of the key sectors uh, that made up the, the front row big British trade. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much, Timothy, and uh, hello, everyone. I've been given the enviable task of looking at some of the finer details of um, Franco-British trade, but I, I promise to be very brief. Um, as always, we look first at the main exchanges of goods. The following slides will look at services and then focus on the main areas for which France, then the UK, have a trade surplus. So looking at this slide, which concerns only goods, we can see that the variations from last year are pretty stable, uh, at least for the first six categories. Um, this is overall an outcome, outcome that's not quite as bad as we could have expected if we remember that 2021 was a year with so many delays in supply chains. Um, looking through the sectors um, on, the, on the page, um, transport machinery, so that's mainly parts for the automobile and aviation sector, are by a long way the most important sector of exchanges. These represent more than double the second in line, which is the chemical products. Still, we're not quite at pre-pandemic levels, uh, which were just over 24 billion. So we've gone from 24 to about 16 between 2019 and 2021. If I keep moving down, we can see the spectacular increase in the exchanges of energy and fuels. Um, the key element here is the sale of electricity uh, by France to the UK which more than tripled in 2021. Um, two elements can potentially explain this. The first would be that there is a, a special provision in the TCA for the sale of electricity. Um, and the second is the widening appetite for electricity produced without emitting greenhouse gases. And France is the leading European exporter of these. <coughs> Next slide, please. Uh, this slide looks at the exchanges and services. Um, considering that Britain has a more services oriented economy compared to France, it's not surprising to see that the UK has a trade surplus in services of around 2 billion euros with France. Um, the number one sector uh, is called other services, but it basically corresponds to all the consulting firms, law firms, advertising, and other sort of business support services. This is traditionally a very busy sector for Franco-British trade. It's almost caught up with pre-pandemic levels, so that's good news. Management consulting, for example, rose from, in 2020, half a billion 
to, in 2021, 3.6 billion. So it's quite a spectacular rise. Um, I, I think it says a lot for our mutual economies trying to react to the change, challenges that it's facing, that they're facing. I'll come back to financial services and technology in a minute. Um, the only other thing I wanted to comment on this slide is travel, which is always an interesting uh, indicator. Um, the increase in this sector seems to reflect the loosening of COVID restrictions, plus 11%. It could be quite encouraging. Um, however, we're still quite a long way from pre-pandemic levels, as the total of Franco-British Franco travel in 2021 was 2.6 billion, but in 2019, it was 8.5 billion. So it's much less than what it used to be. Uh, next slide, please, uh, Victor. So this slide uh, lists and explains uh, the main sectors where France has a trade surplus with the UK. Um, we've mentioned most of these already, so I won't go over them again, except for maybe drinks and tobacco, the number one. This is the only sector which we've measured so far that has seen a consistent and uninterrupted growth since our records began in 2017. Obviously, this is a sector where the gap between exports and imports is the widest, proportionate to the volume of exchanges. Um, three things could potentially have halted this progress, but didn't. Firstly, the pandemic. Secondly, uh, Brexit. And thirdly, the increasing production of excellent British wines. Combined, they have done nothing to damper the British enjoyment of French winelands and spirits. I'll skip to the next slide, please, uh, Victor. Uh, you'll be at your leisure to uh, read the rest uh, when you download the study from the uh, Cross Channels website. Um, so these are the sectors where the UK has a trade surplus with France. Looking at number two, financial services. On the whole, the exchanges of Franco-British financial services have been dropping for the third year running. We've gone from eight to five billion euros of trade since 2019. Also, French exports to the UK have been slowly catching up, meaning that the UK tr UK's trade surplus with France has gone from 3.5 to 1.6 billion since 2019. Tele technology and telecommunications, on the other hand, have done nothing but grow, with British exports to France reaching 2.6 billion and a total surplus of 1.7 billion. Um, and Rafael, it's over to you for the last few uh, slides. Thank you very much, Guy. Hello, everyone. And yeah, switch to the next slide. Thank you, Victor. So after that, Guy focused on, uh, I would say, the specifics in the sectors of trade between uh, France and UK, I would like now to maybe take a, a step back and, and give you uh, a, a, an overall picture of the relationship between France and the UK. So there is an indicator that we have been using uh, since 2017 now, so the first edition of the barometer, which are the FDI, the Foreign Direct Investments, that help us evaluate the attractiveness of both countries, so UK and France. Uh, and I have um, a, a couple of key, key messages to share with you guys today on, on that. So the first one uh, is that the, the UK kept its position on the podium in France, so meaning that the, the UK is the, the third foreign investor in France, which is a good sign of the, the, the relationship between both countries. And France in 2021 caught up, uh, um, caught up four spots, uh, jumping from the eighth position to the fourth. So which is, a, which is also a positive, a positive uh, symbol that France is catching up uh, in terms of investment in the UK. So that's the first, the first key takeaway message. The second one is that globally, the, 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 the FDI recovered strongly in 2021 with a 35% increase, uh, which is quite uh, impressive, to be honest. And it's even up to the 2019 level, so which is a, a really a good sign, because if you don't consider this 2020, uh, which was a specific year, honestly, it's, it's good to see that the investments are back to the 2019 levels. Uh, and finally, uh, one, one interesting, interesting message as well is that France and UK remain the two most attractive, uh, attractive countries uh, in Europe in terms of FDI, uh, FDI flows, France being first and UK being second, which is really interesting to, uh, and speaks for the attractiveness of each country, not only for, for each other, but also for the, the rest of the ecosystem. Next slide, please. 
So here's just a, a snapshot of the, the Fra Franco-British relationship, uh, apart from the FDI, uh, showing the, the position of France uh, in the global trading rankings uh, for the UK. So what we can see is that uh, uh, France remains a very important partner for the UK, obviously, keeping uh, the, its fifth position in the global ranking behind the USA, Switzerland, Germany, and the Netherlands, uh, which uh, and accounts for 6% of the total trade. So that's interesting, to, to, and it, can, it corroborates what I just said uh, with regards to the, the foreign di direct investments and really shows that France and UK are strong partners, even in this, uh, I would say, particular context that we are uh, living today. Next slide, please, Victor. Thank you. So just uh, after giving you this, this global overview of 2021, uh, just to give you a small insight on 2022, because uh, the, the, the Office for National Statistics released uh, the, some, some preliminary figures already. So just a couple of caveats on, on this slide. First one is that it only focus, focuses on the first quarter because it's the only data we have available, of course. And also it only focuses on goods because uh, traditionally the, the, the figures on services are available a bit later uh, from the ONS. So what we can see uh, here on this slide is that overall the Q1 shows a 50% increase compared, compared to 2021, which is really imp impressive uh, with a higher increase in for flows going from France, uh, from UK to France, sorry, um, from France to the UK, sorry, with a, a total of 10.4 million. So that's very interesting and shows that activity bounced back post COVID and allows us to be reasonably optimistic, I would say, for 20, 2022. Sorry. And now, just to conclude uh, this presentation and before giving back the floor to Timothée, which will, uh, who will answer a couple of questions on the financial services, if you can go back to go to next slide. Sorry, uh, Victor, please. Yes, thank you. So I'd like to, to focus on, on two key messages, maybe, uh, that, that we keep away from. Uh, from this presentation. First is that overall, the trade between France and the UK has stabilized, uh, so to 76 billion euros, uh, and shows really promises for 2022, uh, and, and it indicates that there has been, that there has been a start of recovery from, from past events. And the second key message is that France and UK really remain key economic partners uh, which says a lot, uh, given the, the context we are living uh, in right now. So now back to Timothée and Francois for a couple of questions on financial services. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this presentation. And I would say also the good news of the first quarter of 2022. But uh, just a quick one. Um, we would like to focus on the um, one of the key sectors for the UK exports, which are the financial services. Uh, volume of 3.3 billion I saw in, in this presentation in 2021. Uh, could you say and could you tell us how this uh, end of the passporting for British financial services has affected the organization of the, of the different companies and the export of, final, of those financial services from UK to France? And afterwards, the next question will be from France to UK. Up to you. Thank you. Thank you, Francoise. Um, so, as, as a reminder, in, in 2017, the UK exported more than uh, 6 billion euro uh, worth of uh, financial services um, to, to France. Um, and uh, this figure has dropped uh, to uh, uh, by, by, by more than half. Uh, so, we're now uh, uh, seeing uh, 3.2 billion euro of exchange in, in financial services, which is uh, more than half a drop. Uh, so this uh, this is the same uh, for insurance and pension services. Uh, so uh, British export dropped uh, from uh, 1.3 billion to uh, 0 0.7 billion. So um, this, although this is a, a bad news for for British. Uh, Trade as a whole, uh, I, I wouldn't see this as a as a as a worry for, to the giant British financial sector, which I'm sure will be uh, resilient and, and will, uh, will will uh, will will make it. Um, as you say, the, the reasons are, are well known for this. Um, since the end of the transition period, the British financial institution can no longer trade. 
uh, products uh, with European uh, clients uh, directly unless they, they set up uh, a subsidiary in one of the uh, EU country, uh, in which case any business that uh, they do will no longer um, uh, be counted as a, as a British export. Uh, on uh, French export to the UK, um, interestingly, uh, the reverse that what I just said is, is not true. Uh, French banks have been uh, having no trouble maintaining their, their activities in the UK. Since uh, 2017, the exports have uh, uh, risen from uh, 1.7 billion to 1.3 um, 1. So, to 1.7. Um, and the, the, the French exports aren't quite catching up with the British, obviously, so uh, it's still uh, more than half. Uh, but um, the, the resilience of uh, Franco-British trade uh, hasn't either. Uh, it's been uh, made by uh, uh, possible by the, the, the British government that granted uh, all equivalence um, rights to, to EU-based financial services. So you are still positive for the future on financial services? Very positive for the British uh, trade and, and for France as well, they're exporting uh, to, to Britain. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Now we are going to share the, the views of our guests. First, Barry Andrews, and then um, Xavier Jaravel. Uh, are you online? Yes, good morning, Francoise. Delighted to join you. Okay, ah, good. I see you. So, Barry, uh, a quick <laughs> reaction to what has been presented uh, up to up to now. Uh, do you think, uh, and the good news on the first quarter of 2022, do you see the re recovery of businesses here, despite all the problems we have around us in the geopolitical environment? Uh, I just mentioned. Uh, inflation, I just mentioned the lack of energy flow, I just mentioned the war at the, uh, at the border of Europe. What are your views? Yeah, good morning, Francois, and thanks for having me here. Um, yes, it, it's a very positive uh, presentation and uh, frankly surprising uh, because relations between UK and France have not been uh, at a high point it has to be said, over the last 18 months. Uh, I know that you warned at the beginning that this is a non-political uh, organization, but, but uh, unfortunately I'm, I'm a politician, so I, I hope you can forgive me for making some political assertions. That's so true. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, I, I am nervous about the rest of 2022 uh, because you know there are clearly headwinds that you've indicated and your, your, your guest, your other guest will give better uh, understanding of that, but there are serious tensions between the EU and the UK uh, relating to the implementation of, of the withdrawal agreement and the recently published uh, protocol bill uh, in the UK. And that has triggered uh, new infringement proceedings by the European Union against the UK. Uh, it has also restarted infringement proceedings against the UK. And there is, of course, which can't be ignored, the real threat uh, of tariffs and quotas being brought in uh, under the Trade and Cooperation Agreement, or even ultimately the full suspension of the Trade and Cooperation Agreement, uh, depending on how far this bill goes. And just to finish this point, Francoise, uh, my own assessment is that we are in a period of suspension of those issues. I don't think they will progress very much. Uh, between now and autumn and after the party conference season in the UK and before a six month period uh, since the election in Northern Ireland, which was May, in other words, before November, uh, there is a window where a resolution of this may happen. But the mood in the European Union is very much that further appeasement or concessions to the UK government currently are pointless. So it remains a serious risk on the horizon for 2022. Uh, but I, I will say one thing about the barometer, the increase in FDI is really encouraging. Um, and there's a wider discussion around maybe other issues to do with supply chains that are impacting nearshoring, um, diversification that uh, have been anticipated for some time. And I, I'd be interested to hear the views of your economist guest on whether there's a, a connection between those two factors. 
Uh, you know, here we, as the Franco British Chamber and the Cross Channel Institute, we are a great believer that above political issues, the, the relationships with you, between UK and France are so strong so, and have been so strong for years. Whatever did happen, you know, there have been some up and downs, but that we believe, and it is our role to try to understand what is needed to really facilitate the flow between, uh, for the product between UK and France and France and UK. But I would like to ask the view of Xavier Jaravel. Hi everyone, Xavier. thanks. Um, yeah, thanks a lot for having me. Uh, delighted to be here. Um, so I think everything perhaps has been said uh, already that uh, the news is perhaps good uh, in the context of uh, the difficulties, uh, especially uh, with the tensions between the EU and, and, and the UK, but at the same time, the, the, tr the trends remain not so good compared to other countries. Uh, trade flows between the UK and Europe remain low, even relative to, to 2017. So the rebound that hasn't been as strong as in, um, as in other economies. And so we mentioned, um, so in the, in the next few months, we'll have to see uh, the, the key thing is how the situation evolves between the EU and, uh, and the UK. Um, one thing I wanted to mention since uh, Barry Andrews mentioned diversification. That's one of the big challenges that we have uh, for the longer run. And um, one concern is that uh, one big challenge that it's for the EU and the UK to also be able to cooperate on these longer run issues. Uh, in the COVID-19 pandemic, we saw that uh, we're very dependent for specific products on uh, on foreign countries like China, for example, for pharmaceuticals. So in the presentation, we saw that France has a, a strong trade surplus with the UK for pharmaceutical and chemical products. But that's also, also actually where France is uh, the most vulnerable to uh, a small number of products that come from China and that are, that, that are difficult uh, for us to produce at home. And so this agenda of diversifying, finding uh, common trading partners in the EU with the UK, is another big part of the um, of the agenda for for the next few years that um, will probably need to be a priority after the the current tensions have been uh, overcome. What about the inflation? It seems that uh, you know the inflation is going around Europe very heavily and the states and the world. I would say uh, it seems that in you in the Europe continent, uh, UK has been badly hit and more worse. It has suffered a, more, a bigger hit than other European countries. What are your, your views on that, and how it will impact the future? Uh, uh, the future, Xavier, Barry, Xavier, maybe. Yeah, perhaps quickly. Um, the, the the first thing to note, of course, is that for the UK, there is in addition the the shock of Brexit which is this, this longer term shock. And so it's, it's quite hard to know what comes from Brexit and what comes from uh, the current crisis with COVID and then with, with the Ukraine war. But there has been some work, uh, including by some of my colleagues at the LSE, where they try to isolate the effect of Brexit. Um, so basically what they do is that they're going to look at particular goods that come from particular countries where Brexit has been uh, uh, particularly difficult. And, uh, and so the conclusion that you get from that is that there's a big impact on inflation coming from Brexit. Um, one number is like three percentage points that would come from Brexit uh, and including 6% for food. And that's cumulative from 2017 to today. So it's certainly not the bulk of the inflation you see today, but it's longer run trend um, that contributes, uh, that adds to the current crisis. And the other aspect of this is business investment. So business investment in the UK has been uh, essentially flat since 2017. And so um, that's uh, also a big concern because we have this new crisis that arrives in a, in a country where investment really hasn't been dynamic at all because there's been a lot of uncertainty about what form Brexit would take. And so I would say that's the, you know, the, the main reason why we, we might fear that the, um, the difficulties ahead will be even stronger for, for the UK because there's the there's there's Brexit in the background, both with an impact on both inflation and investment, and I think we we can hope that you know, things will be uh, better than uh, the current outlook. But at the moment, uh, 
there's a lot of inflation, interest rates will need to go up to tame inflation. Uh, we will need massive investments in uh, certain sectors like energy production. Uh, it's difficult because uh, countries, including both France and the UK, ha have high debt levels. And so the prospect is not, uh, in that sense, particularly good. And uh, that highlights the, the need for uh, cooperation and partnerships between countries to face uh, these difficulties together. Baris, what, what are your views for Europe, for the other countries in Europe, on this inflation impact? Yeah, well, I mean, from my own country in Ireland, um, inflation is also creating <laughs> pressures, uh, wage growth, obviously, but most of the inflation is um, is input inflation. It's imported inflation because of energy and food prices and supply chain difficulties. So we're trying to balance out that. And I think that's characteristic uh, across the European Union. But I, but I mean, I totally agree that the UK is in a slightly worse position. Uh, than uh, the EU, um, there are there have been historical problems of of lack of productivity in the UK, and Brexit is compounding that. Um, uh, and, and we have to bear in mind that the UK still hasn't imposed import checks that are anticipated under the Trade and Cooperation Agreement. Now they won't happen between now and the end of 2023. They've been postponed four times. But you can you can imagine that. Uh, businesses will already be making decisions. Uh, these will be baked into their investment decisions over the rest of 22 and, and early 23. But, but I think overall, uh, the, uh, you know, I was in charge of the trade policy review in the European Parliament. And the, the absence of the UK from the EU now uh, really does influence overall trade policy. Uh, the French model uh, of EU industrial policy uh, predominates, frankly. Uh, the idea of open strategic autonomy is at the center of that. Um, and, you know, for a free trade, open global economy like Ireland, we try to resist <laughs> sometimes those uh, French, if we might say, protectionist urges. Uh, so um, we try to keep reshoring out of the language of the trade policy review, for example. Uh, nevertheless, uh, there, there will, there's no prospect of future free trade agreements, uh, despite uh, everything that's, that's happened in Ukraine, despite decoupling from China, despite uh, everything. Uh, and I think the uncertainty in the French political situation, uh, together with the uncertainty in the British political situation, uh, makes things um, decidedly difficult to predict. And what do you believe the government should do to improve the situation? Government well, well, it's absolutely clear to me what they should do, and, and that is to resolve the Northern Ireland Protocol issue <clears throat> so that the many chapters of common uh, agendas that the UK and France uh, can anticipate can, can, can be built on. So, for example, uh, Horizon, uh, the investment in innovation in universities, uh, the UK is locked out of that, and it's locked out of that because the withdrawal agreement hasn't finally been settled. Um, issues to do with climate, uh, where there is a, a, a very clear common agenda. I assumed that COP26 would be fertile ground for the EU and the UK to begin to build on the trade and cooperation agreement. And then, of course, security and defence, you know, the UK and the European Union share a common threat assessment. Uh, particularly France and UK as members of NATO and uh, nuclear weapon states um, share a very common agenda here. But nevertheless, none of these issues can be advanced uh, while the Northern Ireland Protocol is unresolved. It was very clear EU policy about sequencing. Let's get the withdrawal agreement locked down and then we'll move to the trade and cooperation agreement and we can build on it from there. So unfortunately, uh, we're in a state of suspension and I feel the, U the European Union will simply wait out to see what happens with Boris Johnson. There's no point in making concessions now um, if somebody will come in after him who will look for more concessions. Something to add, uh, Xavier? No, I, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, maybe just two points. The first is one uh, anecdote on the um, Horizon uh, program that Barry Andrews just mentioned. So it's uh, 
for those who don't know it, it's the, these funds from the European Research Council that um, have been uh, extremely important for UK universities, including the London School of Economics, but many others. And that's a major source of funding for, um, for scholars at, you know, at all levels of seniority. And uh, currently, we, uh, we actually were not able to accept the, the grants from, uh, from the European Research Council. So that's a major shock for, uh, for, for, for our ability to do, uh, to do research in, uh, in the UK. But the UK has reacted uh, promptly by setting a, a new fund uh, that basically replaces the, the European Research Council fund, at least in the short term. And so then the question is whether uh, the UK can join again the Horizon program or will keep this uh, this separate, um, oh, this separate. Could you say again, because you have been uh, cut off. Oh, sorry. So um, we, yeah, I was just mentioning that the, the UK has replaced the uh, the funds from the European Research Council. And, and so we'll have to see whether um, that remains the, the, the new normal or, or whether the UK can join Horizon again. And, and we hope that uh, the UK will join again because it becomes a, a more, a more influential and uh, effective organization with, with more countries. The, the second remark I'm ready to make is the, related to uh, the challenge of uh, open strategic autonomy. So I, I, I completely share what Barry Andrews said that, there, that uh, there's a risk that uh, some of the rhetoric is interpreted as, as protectionist and, uh, and becomes uh, completely unacceptable to, to some countries. Uh, I would just highlight that uh, even in the case of France, the, the real issue is actually very targeted. So there's only a relatively small fraction of products for which there's this issue of vulnerability or dependency, whatever you want to call it. So one number we, we got with the French Council of Economic Advisors is that 4%, 4% of imports are... Um, are vulnerable in the sense that you, you yes. import from foreign countries outside of the EU and you, you don't have a, a way, an easy way to diversify. And so I'd say we can probably build a common agenda if we agree that it's a relatively targeted problem, even though um, it, it can be important because even if you lose a small piece of your, of your chain of production, like semiconductors for in the car industry, for example, then that can have big big impact on, the, on your economy. Um, so that's the, that's the idea of open strategic autonomy, to remain open, but to be very focused uh, on uh, certain goods where, where there are issues. But, and I agree that that needs to be to clarify it so that uh, it can be brought support and uh, we can build solutions in the long run. If I understand what you said, and you tell me if I'm wrong, uh, in order to facilitate the flow between UK and France for our uh, for the British Franco-British uh, companies and businesses, what is important is that the uh, UK and Europe and France, you know, find a new way of doing business and put it in place very quickly and really uh, develop the new regulations uh, very quickly so that uh, we could uh, come back to what the flow was in uh, was 2019, <laughs> more than 100 billion, because the two economies are needing each other in any case. I am right in saying that, or do you want to comment? I'm not okay. sure if you're directing it to Xavier or to me. Uh, to both of you. But well, well, I'll jump in then. Uh, yeah, I think, I think um, you know, I'm very dedicated to the idea of the UK you know, because the UK is, uh, you know, we share a border with the UK and I'm very dedicated to the idea that we move away from a relationship of rivalry to one of partnership. Yes. Um, but unfortunately, uh, the politics hasn't been great. Um, the AUKUS issue around um, uh, nuclear submarines and uh, issues to oh, do yeah, with the, the granting of fishing licenses to uh, inshore fishing licenses to French vessels in, in British waters, um, colloquially known as fish and ships issues, um, have uh, caused some problems between the EU and the UK, uh, uh, France and the UK in recent times, together with the migrant issue. So the politics aren't good, uh, and you layer onto that the Northern Ireland Protocol issues. Uh, you layer onto that the political instability. So while I, I, I get the barometer is quite positive for 2022, um, and then you take in all the geopolitical headwinds that are there, um, 
about inflation, about energy prices, about uh, the, the ongoing war, it just, you know, the, the risk of very serious of a recession. Um, we're beginning to see it in Ireland a little bit in terms of, it, especially in the tech industry. So there are there are issues coming down the track, let's be clear about it. Um, and if a barometer measure, measures pressure, uh, <laughs> we're entering a high pressure zone right now. Thank you. Well, uh, last word, Xavier. Okay. Okay, so thank you. Now we are going to have the views of uh, Paul Taylor, who is the DIT director and uh, in, uh, in France. Thank you very much. Um, excellent discussion. Thank you very much to um, our speakers. And also thank you very much to PwC for being collaborators on what I think is um, a superb uh, resource. It really has developed into a fantastic resource. Uh, so I just want to make... Um, five points i think five quick points maybe t taking slightly uh, different uh, tack i don't want to repeat points that have been made already by uh, our excellent uh, speakers i think the first point i want to make is about the importance of international business and um, exports and i think that's especially true when uh, countries and regions are going through periods of economic difficulty because I think for consumers, um, it is really important that they see uh, competition in, in markets, that they see choices, and that they are able to access value for money. And I think that imports do bring those advantages into uh, a market. Uh, and for companies, of course, for exporting com companies, um, e exports are a lifeline uh, in difficult moments. Uh, we know that exporting companies are more competitive. We know that exporting companies grow faster. We know they're stronger. And we know that they provide jobs and they provide opportunity. So I guess my first point, and this is something that uh, I know Cross Channel Institute and the franco British Chamber and DIT and all of you here are all interested in, is that we really do need to look after our companies, our exporters, and our overseas investors, really, really important. Um, my second point, I think, um, reflects um, a point that um, a number of the speakers have made. Uh, Timothée, I think you introduced it, Francoise, you certainly um, mentioned it, as did Xavier and Barry. It has been a tough couple of years uh, for businesses. Um, so, we, you know, I think we mentioned all the factors, you know, most recently Ukraine, but COVID, transport restrictions, lockdowns, um, the implementation of the trade and cooperation agreement, which um, uh, I, I think is proving um, uh, challenging, particularly for small businesses. Uh, so um, all of that has been going on, as Barry said. Uh, we haven't got around yet to implementing some of the controls that the UK will bring into force at the moment. So it is quite a, a complex picture. And I think as a consequence, it's quite difficult to work out 100% uh, what is going on at the moment. I mean, if I take the food and drink sector, for instance, um, last year was actually a very good year for UK food and drink exports to France. In fact, um, our exports to France were higher than they were in 2019. There was growth um, as regards um, the French market, um, and uh, that compares to uh, a quite um, big fall in UK food and drink exports to countries like Spain, Italy, and Germany. So you could say that is positive. However, we really need to go into, um, the, uh, into the factors behind that, because what I suspect is happening is, number one, big companies are doing very well. Um, we heard how uh, the Brits, and this was Guy, I think, the Brits still love uh, French wine and importing lots of French wine. Well, uh, I, I think French people are still importing lots of Scotch whiskey, and that will be a big contributor to, to, to that. Um, and some of these big companies that are exporting salmon, etc., are doing quite well. So I, I, I think, in, in summary, the analysis that the, um, the barometric provides is really important to help us to focus our, uh, our efforts. Um, third point on the uh, green shoots. 
Uh, yes, I, I, I think it is encouraging that the, uh, the trade data in goods, at least, has been very positive uh, through to April. Uh, a 50% in French uh, exports of goods to the UK over those uh, four months and a 25% increase in UK exports of goods to France. But I think, as Barry said, you know, we have to be realistic and to recognise that um, there are headwinds, there are challenges uh, out there, uh, and um, there is absolutely no room for uh, complacency. So um, a, a positive picture, and hopefully that will continue to improve, but we do need to recognise the challenges. Um, my fourth point uh, is that, as I mentioned, I think it's really, really essential that we have this data and this analysis to help us to understand what is happening as regards business between France and the UK and to work out how we can play a positive role and how we can have a positive uh, influence. So very short fourth point. Um, and my final point is that um, we all have an important role to play in helping companies to get back on their feet, to continue to do business, to navigate the challenges that are out there. Um, as a group of individuals, as members of the Cross Channel Institute or the Franco British Chamber, um, we have expertise, we have knowledge, we have contacts, and most importantly, we have experience of doing business together. And I think that business to business learning is um, extremely important, particularly for small and medium sized businesses. So I, I really want to thank everybody who's been involved in putting together um, the report and the analysis. I think it is absolutely terrific. There is a lot of work for us to do. Uh, and I look forward to, um, to continuing to work with you all. Thank you, Francois. Before we move to the conclusion, uh, I would like if there is any questions. Everything was clear, crystal clear. I'm not so sure it was so clear. Nevertheless, I would like to thank all our speakers for sharing with us their views, we sharing with us their work, and uh, we are very proud to have such a, a team working with us. Thank you very much. Now I hand over to the the wisdom of our, uh, the chairman of the Franco-British Chamber, Thierry Drillon. Thank you, Francoise. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks to uh, our speakers, Barry, Xavier, and uh, our guys, uh, dream team from uh, PwC. And I'd like also to uh, thank uh, you know, Paul, support from DIT, and uh, our team here, uh, in uh, the front of the British Chamber. So, uh, all, has, all has been said. What to have? Nothing. But you know me, I'm going to have a couple of comments. Okay. So, uh, first one is I'd like to look at half positive side, which is about uh, to see. Uh, that France is the number four country to invest in the UK, <coughs> which is the best proof of what we want to do and where we believe we have opportunities in the UK. So very pleased about that. That's a very good news. However, what well, however, we have some cloud in the environment. And it's not going to be an easy road. It's going to be a bumpy road. We know that from the economy, and you uh, uh, talked about that, Barry uh, and Paul, inflation, increase of the energy, the war, the China zero COVID politics, that we're going to see the impact probably in the coming months. Uh, also, uh, some changes in the political environment. All in all, this will have impact okay and uh, but my view my voice as a business leader is guys we need to focus on what we can control we're not going to control politicians 
We're not going to control the worldwide economy. What we're going to control is our efficiency, our ability to execute, and our ability to really build added value and expertise. Having said that, no bullshit. We need each other. We need France and the UK as, I would say, business partner. And we don't care. Part of the business, sometimes we're going to partner, sometimes we're going to compete. It's part of life, okay? It's part of having a healthy competition, okay? And coming from healthy competition, you can drive innovation, you can drive disruption, and you can really continue to invent and to innovate uh, for the future. Um, I think we really do need to see the reality as it is, okay? And don't try to think about future that will never happen. So now I'd like to leave you with uh, to our uh, business leaders, to our members, to a couple of, uh, of you know, very simple words. Today, more than ever, we need to be a drive part of our business. We need to be extremely, extremely pragmatic. Third, uh, never forget long-term view. We need forward looking, which is absolutely key. And last but not least, and which is for, probably for me the most important is, we all know all is about people. All is about talent. And probably more than ever today, we have to take care of people because they're going to make the difference. At the end of the day, they're going to help us to increase overall our efficiency, our ability to execute, and at the end of the day, our ability to, to succeed. So having said that, uh, uh, again, Francoise, as a, as a chairwoman, <laughs> yes. uh, I want to thank you for uh, you know, leading uh, this uh, barometer. I want to thank the, the team working as one in a very clever mode uh, to really produce this barometer, which is a worldwide reference. Thanks to all of our uh, speakers. Uh, I wish you uh, all the best. Uh, and uh, probably more than ever, uh, let's make it happen. This is now. And you know, never forget that when you have cloud, it's an opportunity to create differentiation and it's an opportunity probably to win more than ever.